Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Clinic Gym Radio. I am your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and I'm here with the amazing co-founder of Jane, Allie Taylor. Allie, how are you? Hello. I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. And you're calling us all the way from the beautiful city of Vancouver, British Columbia. Is that right? That is true. It is actually beautiful today. It's, I think it's one of the coolest cities around. It's like a two-thirds size San Francisco, like hilly, gorgeous, Less gorgeous foggy. water, but... It just doesn't have the massive size of all the buildings. And it's not quite as steep on the roads. But we did have like, we had hail here and snow last week. And then wow. now it's beautiful. So I guess that is like San Francisco. You yeah. wait five minutes and the weather will change. Yeah. And I do like the fact that you can fly, you can land at the uh, airport and hop on the sub, whatever it is, the subway or the light rail. Like the monorail in uh, yeah. The Simpsons. We're like, we're, <laughs> we live in the future here. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, Ali, as I said, is the co-founder of Jane, which is like the world's greatest, what do you call it? Practice management software, EHR, EMR. Yeah, whatever. You know, no one ever knows the words to yeah. use. This is the well, problem, like Google advertisements. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, what do they search for? I'm like, I have no idea. They don't, even, they don't know what we're called. No one knows. That. We don't know how to advertise our own product. Yeah. My friend uh, always makes up this point. He says, you know, in chiropractic, he's a physical therapist. He said, chiropractors and physical therapists do a lot of the same stuff. He's like, but we call it grits and you guys dress it up and call it polenta. He's like, so in a world of grits or polenta, you can get $2 for grits or $25 for polenta. We should all call it polenta. Right. Well, it's, it's like the champagne. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, that's true. It's, um, there, is, there is some crossover in the manual therapy world for sure, but I always stay away from that conversation because it, I always say it's like warring high schools. It's like, you, don't, you, know, you have respect for one another as different disciplines of manual therapy, but... But I would never identify as what you do. <laughs> no. Yeah, it would be exactly. Yeah. yeah. But you have so, to believe that. I think if you become a therapist, you should believe that your discipline is the best discipline. So that's absolutely. Fine. I mean, okay. if nothing else, just do the best you can and make it the the most famous discipline around, or do everything you can to do that. And so your your software um, helps people keep great records on their patients, and it's incredibly customizable. And actually, we're going to get into that because. One of the cool parts about it, is instead of just being around chiropractors or physical therapists or whatever, you're, what, what professions do you cover? Give us a smattering of them besides chiropractic. Well, yeah. So in the U.S., our biggest markets are um, chiro, acupuncture, physical therapy. And then massage therapists in the U.S. Um, just make less money. So they're not, mm -hmm. a, um, they're, it's a little bit trickier for them to pay for a software that right. has as many features as Jane does. And then... Um, we're also counselors and nutritionists and um, naturopathic physicians. And yeah, it's a real, it's a real mix. Yeah. So a lot of things that are not, uh, most of it is not hospital based or oh, yeah. maybe well, hospital based, but private, yeah. we, we say um, small healthcare practices would be awesome. sort of our, our heart, small businesses. I'm a clinic owner. I think, I don't know if we mentioned that yeah. earlier, but I have my own practice as well. So that's where Jane started in multidisciplinary practice which offers all of those services of 30 practitioners across a wide variety of disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the heart of Jane at the very beginning was just to service all of those different disciplines. And so that's why it has to be customizable. And we, but we try really hard um, to make it so that if you're using Jane, you believe it's a software for your, your discipline. So we want right. to think it's a Cairo software and, and acupuncturists to think it's an acupuncture software. So it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. It's a tricky yeah. road to navigate. But. but the good news is in this conversation, during this crazy time, you're able to see other practices, other professions, and how they're learning to adapt to the crazy changing world that we're living in. So yeah. we'll definitely have to dive into that later. Yeah, uh, but, that's an interesting conversation, actually. Yeah. So one of the things, uh, so we're recording this basically at the beginning of April, first week of April. And one of the things that everybody knows is most other practices in the U.S., Canada, and uh, everywhere else that you world. service yeah. basically can, are getting either limited or shut out from doing in-person treatments, Yeah, right? Yeah, global pandemic. The world yeah. is changing. And so what you guys did, which happened to be perfectly aligned, was you basically launched telehealth in a weekend. <laughs> yes, in three days. Yeah. Right. Which, yeah. let's go through that because I'm, sh you know, I'm, I'm sure there are, number one, Thank you and congratulations for getting a new product. And thank you for basically giving every one of your customers the ability to bring their clinic into their living room with their laptop. I mean, that's in three days, we went from the need to have a brick and mortar practice to 
uh, practice is still possible. So I appreciate it on behalf of all your customers. Oh, that is lovely. Thank you. We do have, uh, we, I always say that we have the best customer base in the world. Um, and I actually do think it's true. The amount of just sweet, supportive, lovely messages that we get about this is it's really overwhelming. It makes it, it makes it easy to work with our, our customers. So did, sure. so did you guys go from totally zero to telehealth or no. was it already in the works? You know, that's actually, I, I do find that interesting because we had telehealth on the roadmap for the end of the year already, but okay. you looked at our feature request list. It was actually quite low down, like right. people weren't really asking for it all that much. And we, but we felt strongly about continuing to develop it because we think we thought it was um, important to the future of the where, of where healthcare is just going in general. So this was a decision we made, not because our customers were asking for it, but because we felt like it was um, one of those things that we needed to develop to remain current as we moved into the future. Uh, is there more use for, because in the U.S., telehealth was really one of the ways to kind of allow great healthcare to rural areas where you, it wasn't sure. worth it to put a yeah. practitioner in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa. Yeah. Um, but in Canada, you have incredible geographic space between major cities, right? Yeah, yeah. That a lot of the northern communities are very uh -huh. small and very underserviced. And so okay. telehealth, for sure, that it's pretty common in like speech therapy and counseling to be offering. Well, I should say it's counseling. It should be more um, typical, but they're quite yeah. behind on uh, software adoption. So most of them, uh, many, many counselors, especially in Canada, are still pen and paper. So this is jumping them forward about two years because all of a sudden they're all trying to figure out, okay, I need to schedule online. I need to take payment online. I need to see people online. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're being catapulted ahead um, about two years of technology adoption. But I would say that in the U.S., Cairo's are already well on, like you guys have been on, on electronic. Hey, there you go. Pat yourself on the back. Yeah, you're oh. ahead. I mean, your, your government did do some incentive programs to get everybody onto electronic records. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of reasons for people to move over the, for the last couple of years. Right. I yeah. was laughing because I, I, you know, I've been in practice for about 13, 14 years. And when the government incentivized it, there were a lot of technology companies that went, that tried to build an EHR. Yeah. And I would walk around like the Parker seminar or something, the expo there, and there'd be probably, let's say a dozen different EHRs. And you could, from the first mouse click, you could tell who was designed by a software engineer in a dark room, having never seen or treated a patient and which ones were started by uh, somebody that said, Hey, I have this problem. Let's solve it. Who do I know? That's a programmer. And, and I will just tell you, I'm not trying to blow smoke or sunshine up your butt. Like the first time I saw Jane, I go, oh yeah, this was designed by somebody who understands how a clinic or a patient flow goes. This well, I think we're actually quite fortunate that we came um, to market at the tail end of that meaningful use sort of um, incentive program. Yeah. Because we didn't, like if you look at the requirements, half of them are just just so unnecessary for yeah. an allied healthcare practice. So we would have had to build all of this mess into Jane just to get right. certified, which you never would have used or wouldn't have been practical. So we were at the, like at the, we were at the very tail end. It was, there was some very like small incentives left when we started um, selling in the U S and everyone was like, well, are you certified? And we're like, no. And we don't really plan to be. And we're like, we're yeah. so sorry. If, you, if you're looking for the discount or the, you know, the points, you're going to have to, it's, it might be something else. We might go yeah, back to eventually. You're also, do it in a smart your way. price point was so much lower than everybody's. It didn't really matter, you know? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I remember it's, back in the, when I first got out of practice, it was like, oh, what does this EHR cost? Oh, well, this one's only $150 a month after you pay $15,000 yeah, for like the initial the license fee. fee. Like you have to pay to get support. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, uh, so it's not that at all. It's like, just not included. It's like, hey, uh, you like this new Audi? Yeah. Well, uh, you, you just have to pay a monthly fee to keep the tires on or we come and confiscate them. But besides that, it's a great car. I mean, absolutely fantastic. Oh, so, yeah. I, I, Anyways, do Audi. I enjoy it. So tell us about offering a new service because I think there's some people who might be looking at the current state of things saying, I have extra time on my hands. I want to launch into massage memberships or I want to add a gym to their clinic, which is really what everybody should do. But they want to <laughs> offer some... Uh, additional service and you guys kind of got your hand forced into developing telehealth ahead of schedule, but you also did it. I mean, it hasn't been a perfectly smooth road. No. Take us through how that went. Like when you made the decision as the co-founder to how do we actually do this thing? What was that like? Yeah, we had a meeting, you know, 
it was, feels like forever ago, but I guess it was only three weeks ago. It was and probably we, about 80,000 gray hairs ago for your team, right? Like, uh, I think I have a few in this. I have a few gray hairs. It's yeah. not too bad yet. I think it's I'm sure coming. your programmers too are a little bit uh, <laughs> more gray than they were. Yeah, they've been working their butts off for sure. We, we knew we had the basic infrastructure already in place. We called it Zane Chat internally because Zane was one of the programmers that was working on it. And Trevor and I had done calls on the airplane actually using it before testing it out like we knew we had the bones already there but the last 20 percent of any feature is actually 80 percent of the work okay sense so getting it to actually out the door is always a ton of work and so you had a house with the studs and the walls up but no doorknobs door handles door frames exactly so we knew the windows installed use we had the infrastructure sort of sorted out but um the the question we were making is, are, do we think we can get this out fast enough to be helpful to our customers? Uh-huh. Uh, or do we go in another direction and really, because st- we know telehealth is going to be a need here. Yeah. Like h- how far along are we? So then we decided, yeah, we're going to, we're going to go for it. Did you also consider in like purchasing one? I mean, was there one out there? You're like, Hey, let's use this well, or integrate another service. Yeah. You can build like an integration with zoom or uh-huh. you can build something that just launches another service. Right. Um, we knew we already had, we could offer it for free was one of the things that we wanted to be able to do. And yeah. the experience of using it within Jane, we still think is going to be a better experience for our users. Uh-huh. Because, like the appointment sends it, sends the email automatically. The person clicks the, like when, it, when this is all completely smoothed out, it should be the best, most seamless, easy experience for our users. And that's always our priority. So we're always trying to make things feel easy, even if there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Yeah. You so, guys, uh, you know, put up the drywall that hides all the wires and plumbing and everything that routes around, right? Yeah. But like, all they see and, is beautiful, smooth drywall. And it's secure. Like, it, we're not recording anything. We're not sharing any information. We just know mm-hmm. that we we feel protective of our customer community. Yeah. And we know that it's, we know that it's safe to use. And so it just felt like there was a few other options out there that they could use as well. And we do, rec- we did recommend them and we still do for certain things. Our, we still can't do classes, um, so that'll be coming. Like there's still feature sets that we have to add. Cause like I mm-hmm. said, I think before it's a preemie feature, like it was, mm-hmm. it was due, it's due date was October end of the year. And we launched it really quickly. And in order to do that, we were talking about that. Like if you want to add a gym or you want to add something, you can, we reduce the scope. So we just said, okay, well, of course the perfect feature has all of these things, mm-hmm. but what can we pop, what can we get out right now? That's still going to be effective, still going to be helpful, but with, but it's just smaller in scope. That's a little bit more simple. Right. So It'll do it only 80 or 90 percent of what you needed to do. Not even. It did maybe 70. Like it did computer to computer only. So no iPhones, no iPads. We still launched it. We're like, we know we have to get that in there. Yeah. And then we spent the next week doing that. But we still launched it. It's and we just told everyone it's very limited right now. It's a preemie. We're getting it to full term. You can use it this way for now, and then we're gonna keep adding. And we just, but you guys included it in what people are already paying. There was no additional yeah. fee or anything. There's no additional fee, although we did make it clear that that's during the COVID period. Okay. So we just said during the COVID response period, um, because it, we, we did plan for this to be an add on feature because okay. it, it is, um, it's a tech heavy, like video is tech heavy. So it's yeah. a more robust infrastructure and we knew not everyone would want it. So we also don't want to make Jane a, we're getting feedback that Jane's complicated sometimes. And I think it's because we've always thrown in features for free. We were like, everyone should get this, all the features, right? Not everyone needs all the features. So now to protect Jane's simplicity, we're starting to add new things um, as add ons So you only get it if you want it. Okay. So you're giving a upgrade right now as part of the response package. Yeah. And then, but you're also kind of giving it as a as an owner, you're saying, I know this isn't the final product I'm going to release either. Totally. Yeah. yeah. This is very, and we're, you know, we bring our customers very much into that conversation. So we're, we're very transparent about it. We tell them what yeah. we're working on. Even within our own team, we have, we're, we're making sure that the, the devs are communicating to the support team about what they're currently testing. Yeah. On. And then the support team just shares that with our customers. Like we bring well, them in to, to let's the talk more about that. When yeah. you, so, I mean, there's a lot of clinic owners listening and you might need to propose to your team, hey, this is what we're doing. And it's not what we talked about doing for two months ago. Yeah. But right now in response, you may need to do that. Do you have any tips for people about that? Like, what have you learned through this process to say, like, if this ever comes up again and there's a really good chance, something, there will need to be some response by 
Jane to change or add a feature, right? In response to who knows what the hell is going to happen in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Just like the clinic owners listening, you know, the the COVID response is one thing you'll see in your career. It's not the only thing. And uh, hopefully as the future, as we decentralize medicine in the future, we play a larger and larger role, which means we're going to have to adapt to more and more situations. Yeah. So what did you learn as a, as the, you know, as a leader of your company uh, when you have to pivot that quickly? Well, for every, every action that we take, it's really important to me that our whole team understands the why behind it. Like, why are we doing this? Why have we made this decision? And they have, they actually sort of have to believe it too, especially if they're then turning around and explaining it to other people. So we are, we are obsessive about people understanding the decision we're making and understanding why we're making it. And not, I, I don't mean that they can just parrot that this is what we're doing. They have to really believe that we're making the right call. So people can definitely question things we're doing. And we have our value system. It's called the it's Jane's values. We call it Jane's heart. And everything we do, we say it's going to be filtered through Jane's heart. And if you think it doesn't align with that, then you should, people should speak up, but it's pretty easy. Like it's, we, the, our values are um, love Jane, work hard and have fun. And love Jane is broken down to, into many pieces. It's love Jane, the customer, love Jane, the company, love Jane, the product. And so we're like, we do want to, you know, do what's right for the customer, but not at the expense of our team and not at the expense of our company, because those, mm-hmm. all three of those things have to play together. Mm-hmm. So it, this is like deeply ingrained into our company is like, why do we behave the way we do? And then every decision we talk about how this is respecting all of those things. Yeah. I think it's interesting too, because, you know, there's a lot of folks that maybe didn't have a clear vision or or plan for what the next three years are like. And then they get pulled into this swirling whitewater, I think is the best term I've heard business wise, like, Oh, the whitewater of business. And um, you may be forced into certain situations in business and it becomes tough. So for example, if your business isn't healthy and you need to add another service because your old service isn't getting purchased, yeah. Um, you know, making sure everybody knows why that is, is so important because you could look at that as somebody going, oh, well, Allie's proposing that because she is the owner and therefore she wants to make a lot of money. And, and it's like, no, I want to provide jobs for people. I want to be able to pay our vendors. I want to do all these things. And that just means we need to find another way to make another $10,000 a month or another $20,000 okay. a month. People think that money um, and healthcare actually can't be said in the same conversation, I think, especially, you know, every small business owner that I know that's in healthcare really struggles with um, patient care because I think everyone just wants to give it away for free um, and being a business. And how do those two things reconcile? And it, I think it's an important thing to really think through as a clinic owner um, and to you know work through until you're at a place where you're comfortable that these things can go together. And actually having a healthy clinic is the best thing for your patients and your staff. So this is the same for me, like where I have my customers, I have my team and I have my company that exists for every clinic. You have your patients, you have your team and you have your business. And all three of those things need to be respected in the way that you behave. And I think the people always just want to go to the patient um, but if those other two things aren't equally as strong, you're actually not serving your patient very well. So during this response, we've had a lot of people saying, it's shameful that you're charging us while our businesses are closed. And I'm like, my business is also closed and I'm paying my bills that I can pay to keep everything going. And I said, like, Jane still has hard costs. And so for me to answer those emails and not be like, I'm not embarrassed by the way we're behaving. Mm-hmm. I'm super proud of our team and our company. And I can explain to these people who are saying that, like, and honestly, it's like 10 emails of like, thank you so much. It's what you're doing is amazing. And one email is saying, you know, it's shameful what you're doing. And I'm like, you know what? We, we do have a policy where you can cancel your account and we'll continue to store your data for you and you can open it back up. But I said, but our, that was built when some people were canceling from Matt leaves, you know, not when like every single one of our accounts was going to can't like we have a team to care for and we have your data to store and we have to store your data in a responsible way until you're ready to open back up and you want to be ready to go. So I'm just like, I don't actually like ethically have any problem with the way that we're behaving. I'm actually super proud of our company right now for what we're providing, but you have to have that belief and you have to understand your why in order to deal with the people who are going to be negative because everyone has a very small view of you and you have to have a whole view and then you have to stand behind your decisions. And so as a leader of any business or any company, I think that can be really challenging. And I, I say this because I, I, 
I struggled with this. I've also struggled. It's hard to have haters, like really hard to have haters. It doesn't matter how comfortable you are in your own skin. Yeah. I'm sure you have more haters now as your company has grown a lot. You know, I used to actually be like, you know, my mom has no haters in this world. And <laughs> I was like, how did she get through life with zero haters? Because she's like the, an angel of a person. And I, and I, then I just had to accept the fact that there's always going to be people that uh, enjoy criticizing other people and that makes right. them feel better. And it says more about, I always tell my kids this. I said, it says more about you than it does about the person you're talking about when you behave that way. So I said, anytime you're speaking negatively about anyone or anything, whether it's privately or online, publicly, it actually says more about you. So I said, so don't do that to yourself. It's not a good look. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't look good. So, but then you know, we all have these soft hearts. But so I think my my measure, and I've used this many, many times, is I chose one person professionally and one person personally in my personal life. And I said, if these two people knew everything that I know about making this decision and would be proud of the decision I made, then I can stand behind it like 100% confidently, no matter what anyone else says. Because I know that people are coming at it with like a lesser view. They don't have quite as much information. So I chose my mother personally. I'm like, if my mom knew about this decision, would she be proud of me? And then I have a board member who is just the epitome of patience and love and wonderfulness. He's um, he's a lawyer. He's been a tech lawyer here in Vancouver for 20 years. So he's seen almost everything. And yeah. if you see his name in the community, it's just ultimate respect. Everyone just says, oh, Keith, like, you know, do you a know? Tech, a tech attorney, I would guess, has so many clients that have come and gone that patience would be a very interesting um, characteristic to develop in that, you know? He is just, there's something about him. Do you know anyone like this? Does anyone come to mind when I say these things? Like someone yeah. that you just ultimately respect in the business world. There's a, there's a woman, a local female business owner that was a patient and the wisest, wisest person I've ever met. Totally. You know? So very clear on, on what you should do, why you should do it. And, and why she's in business and, and, and she so, was wise about everything, but. So if she approved of your decision, if she knew all the facts that you know, and she mm-hmm. understood why you're making your call and yeah. personally that you care about their opinion of you, then it kind of feels like you have a solid footing. Like at least yeah. you can go back to that when someone tells you, well, that's the worst decision ever. You're a horrible yeah. human being. I remember when I was in college, uh, my senior year of college, I think is when nine 11 happened, you know, Mm-hmm. And I was walking through from, I went to college in Montana, so it's still cold out. Um, or it was getting cold in September. I can't remember. No, it wasn't yet cold. So walking from the cheap, cheap, cheap parking, which is like way outside. And then they would open up this hallway that led, and there's a little cafe there that had a TV on. And I saw the planes at the buildings. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know what to think. And so I was, I'm walking towards class and I get into class. And it was anatomy and physiology too. And the instructor, we all sit down and he's like, hey, I know what happened this morning. And he's like, I grew up in Israel for 20 years of my life. And this is what terrorism is like. And he, and he was so, it was like perfect for me to be in that. And he goes, this is what terrorism is like. And you know how they win? They win by disrupting our lives. Yeah. So I will, I refuse to change what we're doing. I refuse to change the hours of our classes. I refuse to change the workload of our classes. I refuse to change anything about it because that would be disruption and I would be giving them a win. Mm-hmm. And I remember like, I went through this very quick, like, you know, the stages of grieving, like, oh, this guy's a total prick to, well, he might be onto something. And at the <laughs> end of it, 10 minutes in, I was inspired. Yeah. And many times during that class and that lecture, he's like, he would stop and he said, guys, I know emotionally you're being pulled away right now. Focus on this. This is the same as it was on Monday. Mm-hmm. This is the same as it was last week. This is the same as it was two weeks ago. Focus on this. And I was like, I needed to hear that. And I think everybody in that room needed to hear that because there are other classes where it was like, we're going to cancel class today, yeah. which might seem like the right decision, but then what? You have a bunch of 17 or sorry, 18, 19, 20 year olds who are like, I have no direction. I need a leader. Yeah, right. And he was like, that's me. I'm going to tell you how this is going to go. Yeah. That, you don't have to always be like that, but this, he was very clear that he, that's another thing. You guys made a decision. Win, lose, or draw. You actually consider the facts and you made a decision. And I think that's so important, especially if you're leading your team. You need to make a decision oh, yeah. and say, this is what we're doing, or we're not doing that, rather than letting everybody kind of decide their own map. Yeah, we, uh, I'm quite risk adverse, actually, as a, even though people would think, you know, entrepreneurs are supposedly, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not. Especially in tech, like, 
<laughs> yeah, that's going to that, probably stretch you as far as you can go, right? You know what? But we never built Jane like that. We built Jane like a small business because both Trevor and I come from small business. I think we talked about this last time. Yeah. So um, we built Jane with only like if we made the money, we spent the money and we didn't spend more than we made. And that's how you grew your small business too. You know, yeah. you have a loan to start up and then you pay it off as you go. Which is another thing. I'm like, people are expecting to come out of this with no debt, which I find confusing. I'm like, everyone, we're just getting through here. I'm getting a loan. Yeah. I closed my practice down last week. Last week. I Every day feels like a month right now. I just, <laughs> unbelievable time is yeah. very strange right now. Um, but I'm, you know, applying for the government loans and my staff are going on EI and, and that's fine. I, like, I keep telling them, take a deep breath, you guys. This is not your clinic is having a hard time. This is the world is having a hard yeah. time. We are literally all the same. And usually if your clinic is having a hard time, you don't have the government trying to help you out. Like you don't have yeah. the government trying to help out your staff that are like getting laid off. Like we right. we're only in stage one here. And I know the U S is very different than can everyone's every country is having its own response. And actually every oh. state is having its own response because right. there's level relief and then there's federal relief as well. And we're the same. We're having prevent provincial relief as well as, um, as countrywide relief. Yeah. But we're all in this, the, like the whole world, not even your, not even just your city or your state. It's the whole country. It's the whole world. So that's an interesting thought. I mean, I remember after um, I was in this leadership program locally after the, or no, right before the last recession, then we had meetings that kind of went through that and Vegas was hit hard. I mean, just yeah. decimated. Yeah. And I was talking and there were some people that worked for like big banks and, um, and very large corporations, you know, sometimes on the strip and, and others. And uh, one guy said, you know, he said, when everybody around you, I think it was one of the guys at the bank, when everybody around you is taking money because it's cheap, you need to take money, even if it stings your pride. But he's like, to think that oh, we won't cool. have that big resource if it's being offered at the cheapest amount, he's like, oh, okay. it would be crazy not to do that. And I think that there are people right now that are like, I don't know if I'll apply for this loan and blah, blah. And I think like, dude, there's might not ever be a chance where the government comes forward to small businesses and says, let me know what you need. I got my checkbook out. And I think it'll continue to improve too. Like as the res people, the response is going to change over time in the same yeah. way that everything is changing. And you don't know what eight months from now, I mean, we're, we're looking at the immediate impact, but I mean, I have a friend who's a plain, a personal injury attorney Yeah. and nobody's driving right now. That means he's not getting intakes. That means nine to 12 months from now, right. he's not going to see as many cases in court. That means he won't be going to court. He may yeah, need to lay some people off then, but imagine if the d window for that money closes six months from now. Right. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, that could I, be longer term. Def absolutely. Well, we about absolutely. That. What does the return to care look like? Like what is yeah. even, I just think this is so interesting the way it's going. Like everyone's like we said, Kairos are being deemed essential services. What does that mean? Are people actually continuing yeah. to practice? I mean, that's right. great, but it's also like, so what's your responsibility to flatten the curve by reducing the spread of the virus right. versus treating urgent care? I think, what does it look? It looks so different and every state's just actually trying to figure it out. Are you interested in becoming a better provider for musculoskeletal conditions? Well, if you know me, you might've seen me out on the road, but I totally believe in, I love, I adore the SFMA, the Selective Functional Movement Assessment. It is a fantastic way of assessing the movement-based uh, dysfunctions in your patients. Now, why movement? Because movement has to do with motor control, and that's usually the first sign that pain is going to develop. And it's a better, more reliable method than assessing pain. So if you're interested in using a movement-based diagnostic system as part of your intake protocol, I would highly recommend the SFMA. Plus, they've got the best instructors. I'm one of them. So I make it fun. I'm easy to listen to. And... Well, I don't know about that, but I enjoy teaching it and it's a fantastic course. I recommend it. So check out functionalmovement.com and look for an SFMA course near you. Functionalmovement.com. Look for an SFMA level one coming to your area. Hope to see you there. I think that's an important point that you brought up with like, you know, talking with your team and making sure everybody knows what you're doing and why. Yeah. And whatever, if you are deemed essential and you're like, I'm going to stay open, take the information that's processed to you and then you know, let your patients know what you are doing and why we made these considerations. And so we're, you know, I talked to a gentleman yesterday, we limit one patient in the office at a time, which means that there are only, 
blank number of open spots in a day, 30 open spots in a day. But here's why. And we ask that you wait in the hall because you can socially distance in the hallway better than you can in the office. I, there's a billion things you can do for sure. I was, I was like, see, one at a time. I actually was thinking people should wait in the cars. Like and you, so there's no crossover of people right. at all. You should. But we're doing that me. because of we've considered this, this, and this, and we've decided yeah. we've made the decision after considering those things. Here's our plan moving forward. Well, and like we talked about, there's like part of flattening the curve is not just to stop with the spread, but it's also reducing the stress on the healthcare system. Right. And so where are the orthopedic problems going to go? Yeah. If or how about my, the people that were scheduled for surgery who need a joint replacement, they're all they need palliative care for six or eight weeks because totally. they ain't going in the hospital. Totally. Yeah. I, know, I, think, I think that the response has to be measured and it obviously has to be very thoughtful. Like what's the risk of spreading the disease or the, yeah, what's the risk versus yeah. the, how are you keeping people out? Of, are they going to go to the hospital? Are they going to go to the ER if they can't get in to see somebody to help them with their right. pain? So it's, it's definitely a very delicate conversation and there's a, there's a thoughtful balance needed, but there's ways, and this is what I actually want to um, do a blog post for when we do start returning to a more mixed model of care. Yeah. I, you can do telehealth screening calls with people. So you can do a call first before they come in, you can assess their pain, you can assess what's going on. You can see if you would actually be helpful. And then Interesting. Can, I like that. Then you can okay. schedule them for a one-on-one -on -one visit. In Jane, we have a feature where you can add um, a post-care time. So basically you can add a buffer between every treatment that allows you to like sanitize everything. You can wipe mm -hmm. everything. And this is, we already had this for kind of room resets. Mm -hmm. But people can use it as a time to, you know, if you're doing PPE, you can change. I don't know if people are going to do protective gear and change it every single time, but you can at least sanitize everything. You can uh, use our reminder system to tell people not to come in and wait in their car until they're exact. They're, don't come early. Come exactly at your appointment time. Yeah, and I there's just so much great communication going on out there. Of people about how they're why they're staying open, what it's intended for, and how to access the services. Right. And then of course, working with your like associations and colleges in each state to make sure that this is like reasonable. I think some of them are getting lists of like people who are deemed emergency care. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's just a, there's a billion things that we could do. And even if people aren't, aren't open now, when we do start to return to care, it is going to be probably a little bit more of a, a hybrid model. And then yeah. same exercises and depending on the type of, of, uh, of therapy you provide, can you do some of the subsequent treatments through telehealth online? So a lot of insurance providers are really altering the way that they're paying for care to include telehealth very suddenly. That, who knows, that could have a lasting effect. On the way Absolutely. We so it's kind yeah, of yeah. Well, let's let's dive a little bit deeper into that because I know that you do see, and we talked about this before, but you, uh, your Jane is able to handle everything from marriage and family counselors down to chiropractors and physical therapists and massage therapists. Give us some positive uh, little some some success stories you're seeing from anything that maybe we can learn from and transfer into uh, our chiropractic practices. Have you seen anybody that's doing a good version of telehealth or they're using it in interesting ways? Well, I mean, we're seeing like people are doing like bike fits through telehealth. Really? <laughs> yeah, just you could do, you know, it's just, it is kind of interesting. A lot of exercise rehab through telehealth, yeah. obviously counseling. People are doing, we're, acupuncturists are doing like their assessment. I mean, you do have to be careful because every, uh, the rules around what you're allowed to provide by telehealth are different. Sure. So, we do always you can't say, say that you did muscle work or, or adjustments like. I mean, but. most people won't. Um, it depends on the provider, the insurance yeah. provider, the discipline in the state. And the, I mean, it's so regional. So mm -hmm. I don't take anything I'm saying as any sort of like actual advice. Yeah. This is my disclaimer. I need your lawyer. Tell him to yeah. give me a disclaimer. Well, let me ask you this. From what you're seeing uh, or you've heard from any of your providers, if I have a 30 minute visit scheduled in the office, is there uh, ways to think about that time? Because. I'm going to guess, and this is total guess, that the equivalency, there's not, there, there are, so for an exam, if I normally spent 30 minutes, I may allow extra time because I don't get the ability to speed things up by putting my hand on and overpressuring something, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't push on your head and say, does that hurt? And you say, yes. Right. Immediately in two seconds, I have an answer. Yeah. Whereas I might need to- You can talk them through a range of motion. Right. Yeah. You can watch and see how far can they turn. You can see right. if it's like, yeah. So an exam, I might allow extra time. I might take it from half an hour to an hour. However, there's other things where the telehealth offers me a very convenient way to check in with them mm -hmm. that normally I'd say, oh, schedule them for 15 minutes because that's the smallest appointment we offer. 
That's right, the least right. amount of time. Whereas now I can literally do a, you know, two to five minute phone or a telehealth visit and just say, Ali, I know you had those headaches that we worked on two weeks ago. I was just checking in, yeah. you know, and, and offering a different model. Like sometimes when new technologies come along, we think it fills a role and really it's going to fill this different role. Sure. Yeah. You can innovate. Um, definitely there. I mean, there's times of change and, and stress create innovation for, in a way that right. uh, it's like peacetime does not like when there's no, no need for innovation, Fantastic. it just doesn't happen. So, yeah. I mean, we should look at that as the, there's a guy, uh, Peter Thiel. I don't know if you know, he's one of the co-founders of PayPal and, um, he said one of his tips for startups is always think inside the box. Not what can you develop if you had unlimited resources, but with yeah, your limited resources. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah. I, I'm, they, I like, uh, in a, I, I like problems to solve. Like it's one of my favorite things is solving problems. Yeah. And that's why I've said Jane is probably the best job for me ever because every day there's a million problems to solve, <laughs> which I enjoy. Um, but I, when things are going too smoothly, I just get a little antsy. And so it, even with Canopy, my practice, before we started Jane, I was looking at franchising Canopy because I'd kind of gotten it to like, well, it's, every day is the same now. You know, we have our practitioners and we're kind of a capacity and I only have so much space. So then I was like, so what am I going to do now? Um, and so I was looking at, at franchising. And so Canopy is sort of I, like, I need, I need things to solve in yeah. my life to be happy. And so Jane sort of provides that. But when things are going too smoothly, I do start to get a little bit bored. But that's unusual, I'm learning. People like uh, things to be consistent and, and safe and easy. And so part of being a business owner, though, is that there's times where you're going to have to make changes to yeah. your world in order to find success. One, one thing that I'm interested in is the idea, you know, a lot of chiropractors out there, a, a big significant portion of their business comes from referrals from mm -hmm. medical doctors, you know, you come, go to your primary care provider and they say, oh, you know, your back hurts, you have headaches, yeah. go see, uh, you know, I was going to say Jane Doe, but that's, go see Sally Smith down the street. She's very good. And when you, um, you know, think about the friction that occurs in that visit, the person expected to stay at Dr. So-and-so's office for half an hour, almost immediately they're getting referred over, yeah. but they don't yet have enough time and they don't have a place on your schedule could telehealth offer you an, uh, like an opportunity there where you could engage them in telehealth within minutes of them seeing their primary care provider? Like you're saying, do that pre-check yeah, intake and then say, all right, well, we have time two days from now to physically see you. Yeah. Until then, here's a couple exercises you can do. Yeah. Whereas we didn't have that. Uh, yeah, immediate access. Yeah, two months yeah, ago. Interesting. A lot of insurance companies seem to be saying that initials, especially for physical therapy, initials have to be done in person assessments, mm -hmm. but then subsequents are okay to do on through telehealth. But for chiropractic care, obviously it's every, like I said, every discipline is going to be quite different. Yeah. But, but even I, if you wrote off that first five minute visit just to meet that person, you're still making the human connection. You're still and getting this, an idea of what they need. I think that is hugely undervalued in the allied healthcare community is the mental health, um, effects of having a care provider who just mm -hmm. listens to you and cares that you're in pain and talks to you about your pain. I think all of those things do actually have more of an effect than people realize. And there was just a research that came out that instead of offering the, in a double blind study, they offered the placebo and the treatment, but then they also did a different version where they just told you that they're handing you the placebo. They didn't actually administer it. They just said, Allie, here's this blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You're going to do this, this, and this, and it's going to help you with X, Y, Z. Just the possession of the placebo reduced symptoms by like 52%. <laughs> so what you're saying is if I just have that visit scheduled, or I, I've seen this in my practice, how many people do you know get an MRI? There's no therapeutic effect of an MRI, but they have an MRI and they half their pain goes away. Yeah. Well, it's called white coat syndrome, isn't it? Whenever you go yeah. to your doctor, everything is better before you even get there. Oh, I've always heard white coat is it, it, your your yeah. blood pressure's up, you're scared to death. and oh, That happened to me. I, got my, I had to get blood taken for an insurance. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, I don't know if I should say this on something that's recorded, but my blood was <laughs> so high because I was so scared. I do not like getting my blood taken. I don't like needles. I'm a big baby. I got a very small tattoo and I made the tattoo artist like hold my hand and I had a lollipop and I was just like so scared. <laughs> I'm such a baby. Um, anyway, my blood pressure would not go down because he was taking my blood pressure while he was taking my blood, which isn't that weird. Yeah, that is weird. And I'm then I was that. like, mm, I'm very nervous. 
but he wouldn't. Yes. My blood pressure was very high. That's totally irrelevant to everything we're talking about, yeah. but I do get scared. I get scared when I. Right. But it, <laughs> but would it have been reduced if you had met him two days earlier on a telehealth visit and he said, I'm this and that I, you know, I'm going to be doing these procedures. And also I enjoy skiing. And here's a picture of my dog Cletus, who is a golden retriever. Right. You know? So you're building the rapport early, right. I, you know, and especially right now when everyone's stuck at home, I know that people are desperate for human interaction and a little bit of just care can go a long way. Our support team's experiencing that for sure. Our calls are going <laughs> along. People are just talking about their lives. Yeah. And we're, we're like, actually we had this meeting with our, my leads and they were like, you know, should we be like saying, okay, everybody, thanks for the call. And I'm like, no, that's fine. Like, if I, what a privilege that they're calling our support team to have these types of conversations. Yeah. Like, I've been having conversations with my clients and uh, it's great because you also get the, what I call the street level information yeah. that you can't have when you're insulated from it, you know? Totally. And yeah. you know, you're probably actually gathering really good clues about their, like their lifestyle and what their home life is like and what they have access to, like clues that could probably really affect their treatment actually moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how to make them, uh, you know, providing service, oftentimes we guess at what it is the actual solution is. I remember, um, I think when Tesla first came out, they were, some of the people were saying, it's too quiet. And it's like, yeah, because it's running an electric motor. And they're like, yeah, but when I go noise. fast or when I do this, so they actually put set noise generators in there. Big noise. Right? Yeah, just so that you felt like there, it was doing something. And it's like, oh, yeah, that, that makes me feel like it's even better. And you're like, that, it's not actually a solution, but it's what our customers need sometimes, just that reassurance that we are going faster. I do always find it odd. I, whenever I um, have... I'm getting a treatment for something and they prescribe me exercises, whoever it is. I'm like, but can I just come in and do them with you? Because I'm really bad at like finding time to do them. And I'm no, I'm, what if I'm doing them wrong? And so I think, but it's funny to me how often providers think that that's a waste of my money. They're like, well, you don't need me there for that. And I'm like, but I kind of want you there for that because I'm yeah. doing and so I do think there's a little bit also like just ask people like you can do them on your own or if you want to book sessions with me, we can go through them together. Like then at least you're giving your patient the choice and I would pay for someone to go over them through telehealth with me at 11 a.m. every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because otherwise I'm not going to do them. I'm going to be. Right. And so to me, that is good care. I just, but people, it's like that money thing again, this idea that yeah. like they don't have to pay me, they can do it on their own. But I'm like, but I'm a patient and I'm not going to do it on my own or if I'm doing it wrong. And I'm not going to see the success that I would if you were like, oh, your hip is dropping. Like, make sure you keep that hip up. Yeah. Well, let me, let me uh, back up your point and share a story here. I, I did a, I was taking some students through some assessments and uh, showing them some different golf assessments. We had a gentleman come in. We got some case studies from the community. Uh, one of whom was like a, uh, uh, pediatric, um, I think she's a pediatric physician, like pediatrician, um, and then we also had a guy who was retired. He was like 68, 69 years old, loved playing golf and, you know, had done very well in business. So he retired with some money. And so we do the assessment with him and we take him through some things and he's over the moon. And all the students were programmed for this idea of like, get him to come back, you know, once or twice a week. And I go, you know, how often would you like to come back? And he goes, every damn day. Can totally. I come twice a day? And I'm like, and I'm like looking at the students, like people are, ask them. And if they say every day, book them for every day, because what he wants is to improve at golf every day. And he knows how hard that is. Yeah, and that's his clinic, thing. It's clinically possible. Like if coming every day is obviously bad for him, then you would say, well, you don't need to come that often. You're going to, you're not going to see the benefits of the treatment, but clearly like, I think people, they are, there is a fear that it's going to seem greedy or something. And I just, I, I think it's exactly what you're saying. If you let, if you ask them, like, what would they like? And even, like I said, giving the choice, you can do these alone, no problem. Or we can book you in, whichever one works better right. for you. I think it just becomes, you know, becomes patient choice. Yeah. And I personally would choose to come in and have someone make sure I'm doing um, things properly. Yesterday I, I was at Whole Foods there. and I bought almond milk for my kids and they said, you're limited to two. And I was like, don't, or don't tell me I'm limited. I want to buy a case of them, you know? <laughs> now, only because I'm limited. Yeah. Like, uh, I just don't like the feeling of that, but it was like, we sometimes do that to our patients. Like, oh, you're limited to once a week or twice a week. Let them set the, in many, in many ways, they can set the schedule in many ways. And telehealth is offering us that option now. 
yeah, it could be really fascinating to see how it um, evolves certain professions and evolves treatment styles. And I think how it evolves insurance coverage is actually going to be really fascinating because oh. insurance is a very slow moving beast. Um, and it's really forcing some changes, some rapid changes. I think two things. One, I think the way governments view small business might change because they're recognizing the value of small business to the economy because they're just seeing the mass layoffs and realizing these small businesses are all struggling. Yeah. I think the way that the governments view small business and the economy is going to, is going to be really fascinating how that changes. And then I do think that um, insurance coverage for allied health care and telehealth are both going to be very fascinating. Yeah. To see. So. I think one of the things too, when these large corporations and groups are changing making sure that you're, you could call it marketing, but educating, you know, even the healthcare providers around you, uh, what's possible. Like, hey, listen, if you're trying to keep non-COVID cases out of the ER, mm -hmm. we have this option that all you need to do is, you know, we're, we're willing to do a pre-screening with every one of them. And if they fit our, we can bring them in. There are a lot of, I guarantee you there are physicians in your town that don't know that that's a possibility. They don't know that's a solution to this problem that they have. Because they're sitting there saying, I have this 64-year-old who is pretty active but has back pain. I'm not sending them into the hospital. They're not going to be put under for an injection at this point. What else can I do? And, yeah. and if you were to step up and lead them and say, this is what we offer. If it fits in this box, it's a, it's a great solution. Yeah, well, we definitely want to educate what's possible to do through our tooling. But then we want people to work with their colleges at the state and provincial level, because every, every state and province is actually responding very differently. Hmm. My, my prediction, if I like had to predict the future, is that everyone's pulled completely back. But if you've ever been in an ER, you know that people come in with tennis elbow. Like, I, I was in the ER the, with, and I'm like, who, why are you people, like the doctor so kindly is like, you should probably go and see a physical therapist. Yeah. Um, so thanks for coming yeah. in. And I'm like, I can't believe that person waited to see a doctor, took up a bed for something like he's like, Oh, I've been doing lots of gardening. Maybe that's just be, like Canada because our healthcare system is free. Yeah, <laughs> but, like, I'm like, why are you? We see people with going in with a cold or flu and it's like the treatment is bed rest. I mean, it's like, go home, stay warm and hydrated. Like we're not going to hospitalize you for that. We're not, you shouldn't even, you, you made this cold into a, you took it from $25 worth of off the shelf medication to a, you know, $6,000 visit here. But things like a rib out where you yeah. can't sleep, like, and that you're in so much pain, you are, yeah. you are going to seek treatment somewhere. Yeah. And so I think that what we're going to see coming up in the next few weeks is, is everyone's going to start to figure out what do we do with emergency care for people like that? How do we keep them out of the system, especially ones that are being overwhelmed or that are like, and you actually, you don't want anyone in the hospital. There's a risk of infection. Right. There's like just overwhelming the system in general. Yeah. So where do you do have physician's assistants in Canada? Like, do, is that a role? PAs? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, we have, in, in, um, in America, we have PAs and, and almost every uh, primary health provider. So every, you know, neighborhood MD has a PA working for them or multiple. But to your point about um, innovation, that was developed back in World War II because they didn't want to send physicians to the front line because they were very high value assets. Right. So they developed this program to train um, young and smart people to be these physicians assistants, they would go up and help screen everybody. And if it was a big enough problem, they'd ship them back to a field hospital, right. but they didn't want to commit to shipping every injured person back to a field hospital. And they didn't want to have their doctors on the front line. So it allowed for this uh, little subtle change in medicine that has now become a huge industry. They need yeah. telehealth. They could have just brought phones to the front lines. Yeah. in World War II, I mean, their internet connection is sure they didn't have 5g, but they had four. So Pretty it's fine. fine. Would it be totally fine. Yeah. Do you remember your old, uh, what was that, Palm Pilot? <laughs> I had, a I had one of those. Phone. I had a, yep. a yeah, cool I razor or something. I probably yeah. have it somewhere, my, my so, phone. So talking about things that have gone virtual as well, it's not just health. But also you guys had an in-person an in live uh, oh, conference oh. that was planned, right? Yeah. And so I you've know, had to funny, pivot yeah. and change on that too, right? I have a meeting about that tomorrow morning with my VP of marketing because we, most people are pushing their conference to either virtual, it's going to go online during this, the planned time, mm -hmm. or they're pushing it to the year after. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, the hardest thing about conferences for our community of users is you also have to shut down your practice. Yeah. You have to go somewhere. So now you have the expense of the conference, but you also have the expense of lost income from closing your practice. 
And I said to my team, I'm like, they're closing their practices right now. Like we got to move it up. So we're, we moved it to now, which again, we had, we had sort of the bones of something that was going to be done in the summer. And we were like, Hey, we have a few months to work it out. And now we're moving it up. So every single part of our team is just like working overtime right now to try and get all this stuff done. Yeah. But we were like, well, this content, I'm, I think this content is phenomenally good. I'm so excited about the speakers. I'm so excited about the content. There's a ton of Jane content, but there's also a ton of like Facebook marketing. Like, how do I run a Facebook campaign? You know, like just really, how do I use MailChimp for, I think we're doing both of those still. I, I have to confirm that our speakers have moved with us because some of them had confirmed for the right. summer. Now we'll try well, if you need a, you need a stand in, you need to put something in the, on the bench. Let me know. Yeah. I would love to, I would love to help any way I can, because I think that you're right. Like I'm offering a bunch of education to my people right now, because if you have the time, do something with it. Totally. Uh, We have an opportunity right now that people can come out of this um, like a Jane expert. So hopefully they're using Jane more effectively when their clinics open back up. Uh, And then, so it's not a COVID conference. Like we really are still running a small business conference, um, ideally for Jane users, but uh, there's, there is content there that anyone could find value from, even if they don't use Jane. And we just want to be in this, like as helpful as possible right now. So how can we be helpful? That's actually a huge part of the questions we ask every day. I think everybody listening should definitely, I mean, if you have not yet jumped into uh, using Jane, highly consider it because there's never going to be a time where you have as low patient numbers as you have right now, Mm -hmm. because that's the, one of the big things in integration, a new software is like, how do I handle the people I'm currently working with, right? Yeah, we've yeah. actually seen a lot of um, people signing up right now. And we are offering, we don't ever offer free trials because of the, it's you value what you pay for, you put yep. in tax what you're paying for. Love it. And we don't think you get a good a transition if people just open up an empty account to play around. Yeah. So we've never offered free trials, but we are offering right now an extended transition period, it's called, or like a grace period. So um, you can have a month at no charge just to do the transition, learn Jane, do your Love training. Um, and we say, if people just want to learn about Jane, we have a demo site that they can use. But if they're really looking to switch over, we're, they can sign up and our team will help them get like 100% ready to go for when their practice reopens. And so, then, it, it, you know, if you're just starting or you have it in place, it's pretty rare to have a software company that says, here's, we're going to have a conference all about how to use our software and make you an expert within a couple months of you starting or, you know, like right yeah. now is the best time for those things. So yeah, um, them a- participating in the allied conference is just, it's like uh, what do they call that? Uh, when two things come together that are symbiotic. Yeah. But there's a, there was a movie with called it with a uh, kismet or what do they call that? Where it's a, a happy joining of two things. Oh, now I can't remember. I have an English degree too, you know, this is part oh. of my, my background. Yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, that'll be fantastic. And, you know, because I think the, the one of the, the two things that most small businesses. Serendipity. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't even listening to you. I don't, I have no idea what you just said. Yeah. Like, you're gonna digging through this files. I, no, I yeah. just think in small business, especially service businesses where the problem can be solved one-on-one because of the smarts of the person, the two things that never get developed or used are systems and data. You know, they just, because I can solve every problem of the patient in front of me, I think like, oh, I don't need to develop systems because they're, you know, we don't need to repeat this. And it's like, there's so much of your business you could build a system around so that you only do the things that you can only do. Meaning only you can create that human connection, you know, like you only you can make them feel safe. Only uh, only you can do the the feeling things. Like they say, you can't automate a hug. Right. But you can automate your newsletter. You can automate your intake forms. You can automate your sure. um, data analysis. What is your best market? Who is the people, who are the people that are coming in and that you get that are happy to pay you, don't balk about it and feel comfortable in your office? You know, if you looked at the diagnosis codes that you've administered over the last year, which ones are the big players? Mm-hmm. Therefore, if you're going to run a Facebook ad, you should probably run it for things that A, you're successful at treating and B, you understand what their pain is. What are the phrases that they're using? And, you know, if it's low back pain or it's tennis elbow, like if you could just get all the tennis elbow people out of the ER and into your office, man, you're going to win. <laughs> totally true. Low back, lower, like mechanical low back pain. Let's just say that every yeah. single person should be talking to people with mechanical low back yeah. pain. Now, I don't know if you want to put mechanical low back pain in a Facebook ad, 
<laughs> I don't think anyone, it's same as putting a yeah. practice management software. Nobody yeah. knows what that means. Right. But call those patients and say, you know, hey, Ali, I remember you came in a year ago. How's your back? Great. What was really the issue? What bothered you the most? Oh, being able to help my kids get dressed in the morning. Totally. Okay. Yeah. There's a great I opening love, for your marketing. I love people asking those types of questions as their outcome. What is it that you can't do that you want to do? You know, I was like, I had my rib out for a long time and I could do a full yoga class, but I couldn't sleep on my side. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I can do a full yoga class, yeah. no pain, but lying on my side, like I could do, you know, inversions and that was all fine. Yeah. It was so odd. It's like certain, just one thing. But I'm sure to the wrong provider that they thought you were crazy too. You know, like you can do an entire yoga class. Yeah. And with no pain. And I still cared enough that I needed it. I'm like, but I can't sleep on my side. I sleep is very important to me. It's, yeah. It's I think it's my, important to almost everybody. <laughs> Very. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ali, this has been great. I really appreciate all the information that you are, uh, you gave us. And, and I think what I hear over and over when I talk to people right now is there is a positive outlook here. We can innovate, we can step forward, we can create, and we've never been gifted with a better time to do those things. We've been given the gift of time, which that's the only non-renewable you know, resource. I just, that's right. Only non-renewable yeah. resource. Thank you very much. And, yeah. uh, and I, we have it right now, so let's use it. So if people do want to um, get involved with Jane, they want to use that as their practice management software, the solution oh, to their I headaches. For that. Yeah. <laughs> what's, the, what's the best way to uh, reach out to your team or get going? Uh, the website's jane.app. So just jane.app. And okay. we have a ton of resources on there that you yeah. can kind of just um, watch and read through to make sure Jane's a good fit for you. We're always looking for, um, people to really understand what Jane is before they sign up. Cause we mm -hmm. really prioritize happy, happy users more okay. than anything. And uh, if you want access to a demo site, um, you can just send us an email from the website there. Um, now, what if they're in this crazy world and they're like, I want to do this, but I'm overwhelmed right now. Like, I just don't know like which way is up. Uh, can they, is there someone or a service that can walk them through that process? Oh, well, our whole team is 100% available by phone and email right now. Um, so I could literally I, sign up and call them and say, I, I'm coming off of XYZ, Cairo yeah. software. I have no idea what to do. What's step one? And they would walk me through it. Yep. All the, they're, totally. That's what okay. they're, we are, our free support, all, time, all the time, free support. Yeah. Um, and the team cares very deeply. I actually... Yeah, it's really interesting. I had to have a call this morning with somebody because they were not speaking very kindly to our team. And I take that very seriously. Yeah. Um, so they're wonderful humans and they, they care so, so deeply about um, everyone that they're talking to. So, and we really prioritize treating each person like a person. So these are people talking to people, mm -hmm. but they're here. We say you get your, you get a whole team, you get Jane and a team when you join Jane. It's That's not awesome. just the song. Yeah, I, I would assume that there are people out there that are, you know, they're capable of this, but they're doubting themselves because of the craziness of the world. And yeah, sometimes that first have, step, you know, we have um, something called Jane university online that they can run with entire courses if they want. And there's team can do the courses to help them awesome. get trained up. Uh, and I've and even looked on there. It's broken up. Like here's the front desk classes. Here's exactly. the provider classes. Here's the, yeah. you know, billing classes. And there's quizzes and they're funny. <laughs> there's things That's awesome. Do. Although Vimeo is down right now, the entire internet is having just a breakdown right now. Because I keep saying that the traffic is moving from the streets to the internet. That's what's happened. Yeah. And just the same way that you can have traffic jams, you can have internet jams. And then so like our email service fritzed out yesterday. Our video providers fritzed out today. All these independent services that we, that we use are all really struggling under the load. So there's still a lot going on out there right now. Everybody's innovating. We're being forced to, but. And we're yeah. all going to okay. give each other a lot of grace right now, which is. Yeah. The, the right. best of humanity comes out. You know, I went for a walk yesterday and there was a guy playing bagpipes on his street, just walking up and down. And as all of his neighbors were like clanging pots and That's they were like awesome. having a little band outside. At like eight. I was just yeah. like, it's so wonderful. He's probably thinking, this is the first time they've let me do this in public. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's a great like time a to be alive. Shirt. Get a pink skirt on and boots. And like the cherry blossoms are out here. It was so oddly, and there's no traffic, you know, it's yeah. just it's such a weird time. But there's, if you look, like Mr. Rogers always said, you can look for the helpers. There's always helpers. There's always goodness happening in every, in every moment. Mr. Rogers, yeah. we should all be listening to Mr. Rogers. Yeah. I, uh, 
That's right. I Somebody brought that up the other day. Oh, it might have been our mutual friend, John Morrison. He might have said oh, that. Yeah. yeah. So, well, Allie, this has been a little slice of heaven once again. So Thanks. thank you. Uh, Thanks. Go to jane.app if you are interested and uh and we'll get yeah. the allied stuff up there soon too we're the web, we're just confirming all of our speakers hopefully by in the next couple of days we'll have the conference yeah. um information. And allied is the conference that you're uh offering that has both information about how to use jane better faster easier within your practice and also other things surrounding your practice like facebook ads websites all that stuff that'll help you operate yeah. a better business a better john business when they come out of this including john morrison you can give him a plug he'll be there there you go. So, which is ironic because he lives in Vancouver. So really this is no, <laughs> it's, yeah, he didn't, ha he wouldn't, ha he would have had to travel for it. And now he just stays, stays home like everybody. But anyways, uh, thank you so much, Allie. I appreciate it. And on behalf of Allie Taylor, uh, this is Josh Saturday saying, go out there, maximize your license and live the life you dream of. Thanks so much for checking out these videos. I hope they're useful. We'll cover things like rehab, exercise, business model, progressions, layout, everything else that helps you build a clinic. So if you're interested, you can click here, there, here, here, or anywhere to get more videos just like this. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you soon.